we are in the middle of a series called When Life is Hard or The Way of Jesus When Life is Hard. Because see, we, we all incur, encounter hardships, right? All of us. It's just part of life. Whether you're walking with Jesus or not, life is hard. And so when we go through hardships, it's important for us to go through hardships in the way of Jesus. Uh, and over the last few weeks, we've had, you know, when life is hard and polarization, life is hard with racism, and then somehow I'm preaching on marginalization. And so I feel like we've kind of covered that topic, so I'm trying to give you maybe something kind of fresh today. <laughs> we'll see. If you don't like it, just go to sleep. Some of you do anyway. All right. So when life is hard, and marginalization, I think this is a great picture of what marginalization looks like. We're in and you're out, right? We've all probably experienced this in life, right? We've gone to school and had that school experience, or even sometimes at work, or even sometimes in our own family right? Sometimes I feel like that's me and my family, right? That happens. It happens. And so how do we walk with Jesus through this? So I want us to read a passage of scripture that I think is going to maybe challenge us, but also it's kind of a curveball. So let's look at Mark chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 14 through 17. And he passed by and saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus. Now, Levi, uh, for those that don't know, this is, this is Matthew who wrote the gospel of Matthew who followed Jesus. And you've probably seen him very well represented in uh, The Chosen. Yeah, uh, a show that some of us know about. But uh, anyway, am, am I loud enough for you guys? Okay, all right. So he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax office. Yes, yes, Matthew was an IRS agent. <laughs> and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And it happened that he was reclining at the table in his house. And many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many of them. And they were following him. Did you see that? They were following him. There was many. When the scribes and the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why is he eating with tax collectors and sinners? And hearing this, Jesus said to them, it's not those who are sick, or it's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now that word righteous there, you need to put in parentheses, okay? He wasn't saying that they're righteous. He was actually talking about self-righteousness. There's a few things I, I want to show you, though, um, that are in this, and then we'll get on to the passage. First of all, I want us to see that this section in Mark chapter 2, verse, and all the way through chapter 3, verse 6, Mark shares five stories that he highlights to show the rising hostility of the Pharisees with Jesus. In chapter 2, it starts off with a kind of a silent opposition. It's where the man's let down through the roof, and Jesus goes, your sins are forgiven. And it says the Pharisees were thinking, and he read their minds and addressed their minds, addressed their thoughts, to actually chapter 3, verse 6, just a few verses later, they're actually saying, we're going to kill him, and they're going to work with Herod to do so. The other thing here that I find that is illuminating for any time that you see Jesus, uh, that is where he's in conflict with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders of the day, this guy named David Dwab, a renowned scholar of Roman and biblical law. I'm sure he's a blast to be around. Uh, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. You know you thought it too. Uh, the century provides a comprehensive breakdown 
of Jesus' interactions with the Pharisees, dividing them into three distinct parts, okay? One part is Jesus performs a revolutionary act, which Jesus is doing in those verses I just read. The Pharisees question, criticize, and even challenge Jesus. And then the third part is Jesus makes a pronouncement by which they are silenced. Now, when you take those three things and you run those stories in your mind, you can see that it pretty much falls in those three categories, right? And we have all three of those categories in this story. Let's look at something else we need to know before we start. The term sinners actually could be called in our culture outcast or the marginalized. They include criminals, tax collectors, prostitutes. Is Melinda in the house? Melinda, where are you? I thought I saw you over there. Shepherds. (laughs) Physically disabled. Ignorant people. Now, the ignorant there is ignorant in that they actually couldn't read. Right? And so they were considered sinners because of that. People of the land, anybody farm? Come on, any farmers in the house? I knew you were sinners. Uh, (laughs) Laborers, how many of you do some type of blue collar job during the week? Commoners, right? And the poor, that's an exhaustive list, is it not? And there's probably more that we could put on there, right? I mean, that's what the Pharisees were about. They distinguished their righteousness by who they deemed to be not appropriate. They were righteous and they say, look at us, look at us and look at all you filthy people, right? You need to obey the law, right? That's what they were all about. So when you have the Pharisees showing up And they're watching Jesus eat with a bunch of these people. Their self-righteousness is offended. And personally, I think, I don't care. But anyway, you're that way too, right? (laughs) Now, interestingly enough, I, I did a real deep dive in Mark not too long ago. And one of the things that is really interesting here is that it's noted that none of the Pharisees or the scribes were invited to the dinner party. But they showed up anyway. And actually it says they were on the outside of the house and they were so loud that Jesus actually heard them probably through the window. Okay, it kind of sounds like picketing, doesn't it? And the church has a history of being horrible at picketing, do we not? This side's on it. This side, you know what? Are you already asleep? (laughs) Yeah, there we go. Thank you, brother. Uh, And so it's interesting because we have this picture And I want you to notice, here's the curveball, who's on the inside and who's on the outside, right? And they're on the outside by their choice. Because if they were different, I'm sure they would have been invited to the party, right? But I find it weird that there's churches still today that the way we're going to practice our Christianity is to go hold a sign and scream at you. That's the exact picture that this is trying to get us to here. So this is really, really important. So let's move on into the story now, and I'll show us a few things. Religion excludes. Religion excludes. It it excludes. It says, here's what I believe, and if you fit in my circle, you have to believe the way I believe. Think the way I think. Look the way I look. Have the same reading of Scripture that I have. Are you you following me? 
Religion excludes. And a lot of times it excludes to the point that the only people that are in look a lot like me or look a lot like you. My club is heavy set bald dudes. <laughs> but we do. We do. We have a tendency to do this. This is part of all of our DNA. The hardest thing for me after leaving fundamentalism and evangelicalism, the hardest thing for me is I want to focus back and look back and the people who are like pharisaical, I have a hard time with. I struggle including them. We all have a certain area that we struggle with, right? And you know, it's tough for even me because I want to include them, but I want to shake them on the way, right? Come on now, you know you've had that thought for a time or two. You know, as my mom would say, shake some sense into you, right? So yes, absolutely, religion excludes. And let's, let's take a look at how this operates. You're out. Let's keep going. The Pharisees' version of Judaism was harsh and it was power-based. It was harsh and it was power-based. They flexed this power by holding people to an impossible standard of rule-keeping. Do you realize they had like 613 rules? Dude, I break half of those getting up in the morning, <laughs> right? 613 rules. I can't even remember the totality of the Ten Commandments, let alone... 613 rules. And they demanded strict obedience. Remember that scene where Jesus and his disciples are walking through the fields and they're hungry and the disciples grabbed some grain and ate it and the Pharisees were like, ah! you ate something, you picked something on the Sabbath. And Jesus has to correct them and says, you know what, people aren't for your system. But the Sabbath is for the people. He doesn't devalue the Sabbath. He ups it, right? Incredibly powerful stuff. They were devoid of any mercy and compassion. There's another beautiful story where Jesus says he was walking along, minding his own business, huge crowd of people. He's teaching and somebody touches his garment. Remember the story? And it says that there was this lady who had an issue of blood for 12 years. Now, that story, face value, we're all mature adults in here. We know what that's talking about. And, and whenever a person is in that place, whenever a woman's going through her menstrual cycle, they are deemed unclean. Isn't that crazy? And if you as a husband touch her during that time period, you're unclean. And so here was a woman for no, no choice of her own, was excluded by the religious system for 12 years. She wasn't even allowed to go to temple because she was unclean. So they were people who were devoid of mercy and compassion. This is a big one. They saw people as their enemies. See it? Who? <laughs> Joe, what did I do wrong? <laughs> I'm just playing. Give it up for Joe in the back. He's amazing. He's doing double duty today. Where were we? I'm just playing. So they saw people as their enemies who needed them to save them. I mean, can you imagine going through life thinking I'm so high above you that you need me to fix you? Have we known some people that, like that in our life? They probably don't get invited over for dinner a lot, do they? Are you, are you with me? It, it's tough. It's really tough. They marginalized people who did not think like them, act like them, and did not view the world the way they did. They fiercely opposed anyone who would challenge them or their power structure. 
they murdered Jesus because of this. See, we often have a theology around Jesus' death, how he died for us so that we wouldn't have to, et cetera, et cetera. They didn't know any of that. All they know was here was a guy that was loving people he shouldn't be loving, eating with people he shouldn't be eating with, traveling and journeying with people he shouldn't be journeying and traveling with, and his teaching was so good that people were flocking to him, and they were like, you know what? We need to kill this guy. That's how deep a religion like that can go. Moving on. So, a couple of thoughts. Does any of this resonate with you? Do you have you had this experience where you've been on the receiving end of that type of harsh treatment, lack of compassion, lack of mercy, lack of grace? Does it feel great? No, not at all. It's a hard, hard place to be. And my fear is that if we're not careful, this will become our practice. It can become our practice, who's in and who's out. Interestingly enough, the in people are the people who look mostly like us. Have you ever went to a different culture and heard them talk about Jesus with the Bible? Have any of you had that experience before? It's a great experience. Have you noticed that theirs is maybe different than yours? That's because they grew up in a different place. That's because where they live have different priorities, different ideas. They grew up with different preconceived conditions. I can remember sitting down with First Nations people when I was at my first New Life Church on Vancouver Island. I loved it. I went there to start ministry towards um, what Americans would say were Indians. I went there to be with them and to start a ministry for them. And I can remember how they read the Bible. Because, see, we tend to think of we're the persecuted ones and the world is the persecutor. But in their world where they were forced into residential school, and that's where the Catholic Church sent all their pedophile priests and nuns to the end of the world. The ones that were against them were actually Christians. That's a lot of work to repair, amen? And that's why I think it's so important, and we can't overstate this enough, that the boss of this church is Jesus. Amen? And we're going to follow the way of Jesus. We're not going to marginalize. We're actually going to do something different. Let's look at this. Man, this guy here, I don't know who Pastor Shane is, but he's brilliant. <laughs> okay? Jesus has a huge, massive circle. Let me say that again. Jesus has a huge, massive circle. Now, what do I mean by that? You've heard Pastor Ron say, we don't draw lines here. We draw what? Circles of inclusivity. Let, let me say it this way. We erroneously teach that here's the kingdom of God, and if you just obey all the rules and you do things, you can get in on the kingdom, right? You can become like us one of us. And if you come in here, you can get your act straight. Right? Now, I know we're laughing, but there's a lot of churches that believe this. Okay? But actually, if you study and you look at Scripture, the kingdom of God is not a small circle that seems to keep shrinking. It's a big circle that keeps expanding. Okay, I don't think y'all caught that. It's not a small circle that's shrinking. It's a big circle that keeps expanding. All of us are in. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that amazing? All of us are in. Regardless, period. In. Boom, done. No buts, no red tape. 
No anything. Jesus just says, come all. Right? Amen? This is hugely amazing and awesome. And while it's something that, yes, we hear over and over again, you have to understand in Jesus' day, this was revolutionary. Because the whole world was set up in a way to marginalize people. If you're not Roman, if you're not Roman board, you're not Greek, well, you're kind of out of this group. If you're not rich, you're kind of out of that group. If you're not middle, are, are you following me? It was set up on that. Jesus came and said, you know what? This is all wrong. You're all in. Come to me. Anyone, everyone. And if you come here, I'll change you. Is that what he says? He says, if you come here, I'll give you rest. Because listen, when you've been marginalized, your soul is weary. It's heavy. And the first thing we should do is try to give it some rest. Amen? Amen. Powerful, powerful stuff. Let's go to the next slide. So, Jesus' circle. I've already told you this. Two ideas about Jesus' circle. It's a circle you can get in on or it engulfs you. I like that idea of being engulfed. Don't you? Yeah? Kind of like being hit by a wave at the beach that you weren't ready for. I'm just playing. It's not that bad. (laughs) But I want us to see here. There's a significant moment. Some translations, the New Living Translation is one of them. That's why I chose the New American Standard today. Some of them translate, instead of recline, it says sit. But there's something important here that you have to really catch to understand, again, why the Pharisees were so upset. One significant moment is Jesus reclined at the table. This reclining at the table is actually what the host of the party would do while the guests are being served, etc. But we see Jesus in that key position as host. Psalm 23, he prepares the table for me in the presence of what? My enemies. And this is also a beautiful picture for what we find in Revelation where it talks the marriage feast. When we enter into heaven, what's the first thing we're going to do? Eat brisket. (laughs) With Jesus. Right? For all the vegetarians and vegans, I'm sure there'll be some lettuce. (laughs) I'm just playing with you. There'll be tofu. (laughs) But anyway... This is really huge because the Pharisees not only saw Jesus eating with them, but he was hosting them. Remember the phrase, and there's many who follow Jesus just like this. And I'm so glad, church, we are a church of misfits. You know that? Amen? And I'm a misfit. This is the first place I felt at home. We're all misfits. And guess what? We fit in right with the crowd that Jesus is hanging out with. Isn't that cool? Yes, sir. All right. So it's a beautiful preview of of what's to come. And that's the reason why they're so insane. Jesus is hosting people, declaring them equals and eating with them. What an amazing picture and an amazing contrast of Jesus and religious leaders. See, there's a lot of marginalization that we cannot do anything about in our culture. You realize that, right? Politically, we can't do anything about that. We can't do anything about what the world system does, but we can do something about the kingdom system. Amen? You know where Darby was talking about taking your pitcher of water and going out? Let me share something with you, my brothers and my sisters. You don't understand the power if you've never been on the receiving side of someone who accepts you for who you are. I love what Bernie Manning says. Bernie Manning says, God accepts us as God accepts us as we are, not as we should be, because we will never be as we should be. 
Isn't that powerful? He accepts us. And my brothers and my sisters, when we enter into a journey with Jesus and we're working in this world of marginalization and people are fatigued by it, they're tired, they're weary. Who has God ordained and called to say, hey, there's something different with me? The cool thing about Matthew is, you know, he was an IRS agent for Rome, right? There was also a dude in Jesus' inner 12, like his closest circle, his inner 12, that was called Simon the Zealot. And he wanted to kill everybody like Matthew and kill the Romans. Could you imagine dinner party time? And what Jesus had to work with. And in the middle, you have James and John, and they just want to call fire down on everybody and just burn it up, right? So anyway, it's a beautiful, powerful thing with Jesus. And he's called us to be a Jesus community so that when we take our water pitchers out and we do this gardening, we're not only gardening them with the goodness of God, we're gardening them with the acceptance of God. And that no matter how far you are on the margins, there's a place for you. See, believe it or not, I know this is maybe weird a little bit, but I was a kid always on the margins. I was the kid that you would pass by as this guy probably doesn't have what it takes to make it. I can remember my ninth grade teacher, world history, looking at a seating chart and going, Shane Woodleaf, your seat is right here for the rest of the year. I know what it's like. It's not fun. And I spent years trying to fit in. But what I didn't know was there was a Jesus like this who accepts and loves and gives me rest. He doesn't love Shane for who he could be. He loves Shane for who he is. And the cool thing is, is that your story too. Let's look at a couple of things here. Things to think through this week. Consider the nature of your actions and thoughts. Are they more aligned with the self-righteousness and legalism of the Pharisees? Or are they influenced by the compassion of Jesus? As you go this week, and this isn't meant as a condemnation thing, I'm just saying we all have to check ourselves because this is innate in all of us. But we need to do this, right? We need to compare. We need to think about how am I acting like Jesus? Second thing, think about someone you've previously excluded from your circle. How can you actively include them in your life this week? How can you do that? Think about it. Pray about it. Sit with Jesus. Ask him. He'll show you a way. And if you want to take your phones out and take a picture of this next prayer, I think this is a pretty amazing prayer that you can keep with you through the week. Now, a lot of people want to attribute this prayer to Francis of Assisi, but there's really no evidence of that, but it's a good prayer nonetheless. So, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me bring love. Where there is offense, let me bring what? Pardon. Where there is discord, let me bring what? Union. Where there is error, let me bring truth. Where there is doubt, let me bring faith. Where there is despair, let me bring what? Hope. Where there is darkness, let me be your light. Where there is sadness, let me be your joy. Oh, Master, let me not seek as much to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to what? Understand. To be loved as to love, for it is in 
giving that one receives. It is in the self-forgetting that one finds. It is the pardoning that one is pardoned. It is in dying that one is what? Raised to life. Isn't that a powerful prayer? So let's pray that this week, okay? Let's pray. So Father, we come before you now, and, and, and God, I'm so thankful that your circle's huge, and it fits all of the misfits like us. I'm so excited that your circle is ever expanding. I pray today, Father, for those in here who may be in a place that says, I'm not sure how Jesus feels about me. Father, I pray today there's been some clarion insight. To you are the Jesus that is for us, not against us. And I pray this week that as we go out, we would be agents of that prayer. It's in your name we pray. Amen.